the rant over. So this is um, this is actually two a couple of talks stuck together, um, based on this. This is my brief commercial break, based on this material. That, some of the material that came out of this, and some of the things we learnt since then. So that's the end of the commercial break. Are you all right with the English at the back? Is there any problem? Stick your hand up. So if, if you're any any, because I know I speak English English, which is worse than American English. Right. So here's the standard test-driven cycle. You write a failing test. You do something, watch it fail. That's important. You do something straightforward and direct to make the test pass. And then as you discover structure and you see patterns and duplication, you refactor. Right. Everybody knows how to do that now, right? Um, but it can go wrong. Um, this is an um, actual test code from a client I had a while ago. Uh, that's part one. That's the actual test. Um, that's the more test. That's the more test. Um, there's also, it inherits from a, uh, a parent class that's got more stuff in it. Um, I didn't notice this for a while, but there's a god object and a mock god in there. Um, and that's the thing. What does that do? I don't know. They didn't know either. Um, and I. Pretty certain that's not what we meant when we started talking about this stuff. Um, and they weren't stupid by any means. They were all from top universities and things. Um, and in fact, it's a slight sign of their sort of raw ability that they could, they could keep this thing alive um, because you know, they could remember stuff. So they actually had to be quite good to make this work. What does this test do? Um, it tests internal action. What does that mean? I don't know. They didn't know either. And it took us a long, long time to clean this up. Um, and it, they just sort of went off the rails. Um, and partly because they were self-taught, um, but partly because they weren't listening. And you know there's this phrase called code smells, is when you, you, know, you look at certain code and it just, it just seems wrong. Well, you have the same thing in, in tests. Um, and what you see is, is that, um, some tests smell because the actual structure of the test, the, the intent of the test is OK. It's just very badly, badly written. But sometimes tests go bad because the code that they're working on is not quite right. Um, and what we found, and one of the things we talk a lot about, is that code that's easier to test tends to be easier because it f does the right things. It's, it follows good object-oriented style. It's focused. It's coherent. It has clean dependencies. And so what we've looked at, hi, Farah, yeah. Uh, just a question about the previous test. Was that written before the actual yes. code was written or after? It was actually test driven. Oh, actually, it was okay. a bit of both. And actually, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that in a minute. Because that's actually the next slide. Sorry, the question was that written before or after. Um, so what we've learned over the years is to become sensitive to what the tests are trying to tell us. So there's another little loop in here, which is, about to write a failing test, I can't, it's a bit difficult. And there are a couple of responses to this. One is to go and do something extremely clever, like rewriting Java bytecode or something like that, or hacking into singletons or whatever it is. The other one is to say, aha, this test is trying to tell me something. Why don't I listen to it? Um, and that's the point at which you, you step back and you think, actually, this code isn't quite in the right shape. It might be, it used to be, but now things have moved on, or it might be that it was never right. Um, and part of the, the, the benefit of doing this in the middle of this loop is you get immediate rapid feedback about the quality of your design. Because you, if it's not easy to test, it's probably not going to be very easy to work with um, when it's in production. So this is why we talk about um, letting tests guide your development. And this is to distinguish between a lot of people, what, what we see them doing, a lot of teams, we see them writing tests and code at about the same time, sometimes a little before, sometimes a little after. But they're not looking at it from the test point, from the test point of view, from the client of the code. What you're trying to do is, is look, at the, look at the code you're about to write from the outside. How's it, what's it like to be a client of this code? Rather than looking at it from the inside and saying, oh, I can push this functionality out. So we've got, I've got sort of two, three or four patterns of 
com or common things that I see um, that are test smells that I just want to talk through. So a common one is too many dependencies. And that long example was full of dependencies, I mean dozens of them. Um, and one of the things that suggests is that the code you're working on, that its responsibilities are unclear. So here's a little example sort of thing. Um, I don't know what it does. It, this is a test that um, it takes a message and unpacks it in some way and goes and finds a counterparty and goes to see where the counterparty is and then recalls the receipt and does a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but if you'll notice, in this case, there's, there's one, about six dependencies. That might not be a lot, but it's actually, it, well, it's, it, it's the sort of thing that fits on the slide. Um, sometimes it's quite reasonable to have a half dozen dependencies, depends on the situation. Um, but it is a bit of a, it is a bit worrying. Let's go and look at something at the code. And so here's, a, here's the actual inside. And you see we, we it, it does various steps. And, um, and then does some processing in the middle. So there's this first bit, which is, I've got an unpacker and a counterparty finder, and that gets me the unpack message. And you notice that actually those always travel together. Is actually the only reason you have those two dependencies is to get the raw message from one to the other. So why I've got two, two dependencies to do that. There's the other part down the bottom, which is the same sort of thing. What I actually want to do is, once I've done this, is go and report this message to somebody useful. And again, I'm carrying three dependencies here um, to do one thing. Why is that happening here? And that's often a clue, is that you, you find when you look at these sort of things, is actually there's a missing concept in there. There's three or four objects that should be um, bolted into something higher level and pushed out of this code. Um, and it's often, you often get one of these while your sort of code is in transition, but then the, the trick is to recognize it. And we are, what we actually want to say is something like this. Um, I unpack the message, I record it, and then I send it somewhere else. And now, if nothing else, you can see that this is much more consistent. It's, it's much more at one level, rather than all this detail that we, we were dealing with a moment ago. So another common pattern is too many assertions. So uh, here's, here's an example. This is, this is actually um, a framework called JMOC, which is, we worked on. But the essential point about this is that all these calls, the, the thing to notice about this is all these calls are existing, insisting on exactly how often we call, make each of these calls so we can get a, a value back. Um, but actually, if we look more carefully, we happen to notice that this one, if you can read that, that's the only one that changes the outside world. The rest are all queries. So we talk about this as an action and a, and a, and a query. And we come up with this rule of thumb, which is that we, we stub actions. We just allow things to happen. It's just infrastructure and support. Whereas this is the, uh, we stub queries, sorry. This is the one that actually matters. This is the one that changes the world outside the object. So actually, let me just step this through. So this is uh, the actual code. But one thing we can do, like I say, is loosen the, loosen the, code, loosen the test up a bit. Um, and that highlights the fact that this is the one that matters. And people I know that worked with us say they were surprised at how few assertions that we wrote, how few expectations we wrote. Um, because we're trying to get the test focused on, we're trying to, it's the same underlying mechanism, but we're trying to, to communicate to ourselves and other people what was important. And then when things change in sort of subtle way, in, in sort of minor ways, it doesn't mean that all your tests break. It means only the tests that matter break. But it's the same sort of thing here. If you look here, there's a whole bunch of noise going on in here, which is a bit of a clue. There's lots, and it's imbalanced. You can kind of see this, it's not symmetric. So what we actually meant is probably something like this. A simple, a simple choice and then dispatch to the right person or to the right uh, collaborator. 
So a lot of the, whoa, I have to go through all this stuffy stuff. Um, so again, when you see a lot of, an awful lot of assertions going on in a, in a test, quite often that's a clue that too much is happening here. So the third one in this, in this section is I've got a test, and the only way I can make the test work is some magic. And you know, in, in the Java world or C-sharp world, that tends to be doing clever things with the, with the runtime or intercepting in various ways, trying to work around the type system. Um, so here's a test. And it says that, sorry? Oh, here's a test. It says that, um, that um, what does it say? It says, if I get the request, a uh, second request not on the same day, then I reject it. And clearly, I don't want this test to have to run overnight, because that would be very slow and boring. Um, What's the problem? Well, you notice right in the middle, there's this, this. This is effectively, underneath the covers, this is a singleton system, get time in millis. Um, I've, you can't see it here, but I've introduced a singleton, a global singleton, into this code that I can't control. The dependencies aren't clear. They're imp implicit. Um, what can I do with that? Well, what a lot of teams do as a first step is to introduce a clock that they pass in. And uh, that gives them control over time within, within the unit of code, rather than relying on this, this global value. Um, it has a couple of nice features. I mean, it's, firstly, it makes the test kind of obvious that I can see the control, of the, uh, uh, the control of time in the test. It also makes it clear that the, the, the thing I'm talking to, the receiver, has a dependency on time. So I know, as I get one of these receivers in my hands, that I'm going to have to deal with time. And so you can trace the time dependencies through the code. Because one of the other problems with date, date now is if it's scattered through the code, it's very difficult to centralize it, to understand what the effect of a change of uh, timing is. But if you look at this, it's, like I say, it's a bit better. It's a bit easier to test. But that's a clue. Once you crack this open, you start to think, why have I got all this stuff about date and time, and then some other stuff about, about requests? I've got two languages in this method. I don't really want to know about clocks. What I actually want is something perhaps more like an expiry checker. That's what the domain says. The domain says, I want to know when this thing has expired. So why don't I just say that? And then the test collapses much more simply. And the test is all, again, you've got one language. It's about messages and expiry rather than the, hap the particular implementation of a clock. And the nice thing about that is, is that you do this because it's easier to test because it's a better, you know, more, coherent, uh, um, more coherent code. And then it turns out they want you to have set up a server in a different time zone. And this is, this is what protects you against the future. This, this is... Once you've got this in place, you've got your policy in one place, and you can cope with things like time zones. But you can't if you put date, get time, scattered through your code. It's just an absolute nightmare. So in this vein, here's my favorite example. Um, this is a ship's log from 1892. But there are two points to note about this. One is that it's a public record. This is not for the captain's personal you know, diary or whatever, it's not to make him feel good, it's because it's a, it's a formal record of what's going on. The other thing is, is the word formal, is that it's structured. It's not, he doesn't just, the captain doesn't just, just write down what, whatever they feel like. But there's a, there's a formal structure to this. So here's some other logging, which should be familiar to anybody that works in any of the, the, the common languages. Um, we've got a static. Got, we effectively, we've got singleton. Very unpleasant to test. And I know you can do clever things, but it's unpleasant and brittle and all the rest of it. We've also got a mixture of languages. So we've got some stuff about miracles and full moons and then some Java stuff in here with some strings. What's that about? Why am I mixing languages <coughs> uh, or mixing domains? Um, and then, the, of course... The way most people do logging is you've got 
dozens of these logging objects scattered all over the place. And again, it's very hard to sort of keep a track of what's happening. And one of the important things about logging is logging is, if it's important, if it's an error, for example, that's public API, that's public user interface. That goes into the production logs, and if it's important enough to put in the production logs, then it's important enough to test. But that's really hard to test. So rather than talking about the implementation, why don't we talk about the intent? And we pass in something, a new collaborator, that will do the reporting for us. And then we can decide what to do with that later. Um, and then we can get... One is, is again, it's, we're now in one domain rather, rather than two. And however we implement the wizard, the wizard um, that's not the concern of this code. And I'll come back to this later because it's, it's my favorite example. Um, so at the moment, this has all been talking about unit tests. And this is, a, this is what's known as a port, a, a picture, our picture of what's known as a ports and adapters architecture. And the idea in the middle, you have your nice clean domain code, everything's nice and clean and done properly. And then you have to deal with nasty things like databases and people. So you have these interfaces, not quite to scale, but these interfaces that describe what your domain code needs from the outside world. And those are your ports. And then you have narrow adapters that do just enough to implement those uh, ports in the real world. And so far, this is all unit stuff, so that's all in this world. Um, the way we like to do things is where do these unit tests come from? They come from a high-level end-to-end sort of acceptance test, um, which sort of describes the functionality in an outward-facing way. And what we just what we what we discovered, or well, what, what we believe come to believe, is that there are advantages to doing test-driven development at the unit test level, but there are advantages at the system level as well. <coughs> the unit tests help us understand the quality of the code that we write. The system level tests help us understand things about the, uh, the quality of the systems that we write. So here's system level testing. In, I mean, a common way is to come in completely from the outside, treat the whole thing as a black box. There are more uh, sophisticated ways of doing this, but this is the picture for now. So what do we need to test the system? We need to know things like what the system is doing, when it's stopped, which is often quite tricky in a distributed system. It's often not exactly clear. We need to know when it's gone wrong, um, and preferably why it's gone wrong. There's nothing worse than a test that goes, you know, big system test, and you get a red mark, and you go, I don't know what happened, and then you drop into three days of tracing and debugging to find out what happened. And then finally, you need to restore it to a good state so you can move to the next test. You need, to, you need a, um, a clean foundation. <coughs> and what, we found, what our claim is, is that we found that um, test-driven development at the system level tends to drive out the hooks that we need to support the system in production. So let me just sort of show you a couple of examples. Oh, I'm missing an apostrophe. So let's start with the, where does the system actually end? So here's a common one. Um, here's our nice, clean, beautifully written system. And here's this Byzantine strategic system that has the data we need. I don't know who works in large organizations, but presumably everyone has one of those. Um, in the banks, these are traditionally written in America, but anyway, I didn't say that out loud. Um, oh, well, we can't create one of those to test against it because it's too hard and too expensive and too big to create, and it's not sure they know how to. Um, can we substitute the, at the protocol level? Well, actually, that's a bit difficult because they're using this very clever binary protocol that's all optimized, and you know, we don't know how to do that. Well, they've helpfully given us this little library that we can plug into our code. Um, unfortunately, it's completely locked down, and there's nothing we can do with that apart from plug it in. And, oh, by the way, did I tell you it leaks memory? Um, and I've certainly had, I had a situation with this years ago when um, I was working in .NET and somebody had written this sort of directory lookup -y thing and based it on Active Directory. And they'd been, they were trying to be helpful, so they'd locked everything down, which meant to even look at it, I had to install Active Directory on my machine, which I didn't want. 
and I had to install an Active Directory service to make sure I didn't touch production, just to look at this thing. So obviously it didn't come in. So what can we do? Well, we can do the traditional thing and introduce a level of indirection. And this is our port, if you like, this is our ports and adapter. The port is a simple API that describes just what we need from this service and no more in our terminology, not in their terminology. Nice simple protocol, something that's very easy to work with, probably HTTP. Um, and then a little adapter here, commonly known as a simplicator or a anti-corruption layer or a protocol converter that gets us from one to the other. Um, and this would be in a, in a separate process for this kind of work. Um, and when we're testing the system, that gets very easy, especially if we're using something like HTTP. We can, we can just pop up a, a fake a fake service that responds, and that we, can, we can fix it in the test to respond appropriately and check that the right calls are made. Um, so that's nice and easy. Um, but how do we know, if we go back, how do we know this adapter works? We can do the same thing. We can write um, some more, some smaller focus tests that do something minimal just to make sure that the whole thing works together. And you get some very nice effects from this. From this one, if you're using a common protocol, it turns out, in this, this particular case, that actually you can put a standard web cache in just squid, you know, something off the, off the shelf that everybody understands and massively reduce the load on the enterprise system <coughs> because it's all query based and you can tune it on the fly and all the rest of it. So something you put in for testing turns out to be really useful. If you separate, separate out the concerns, it turns out you can test the API and when they want to do a new release, you can pre-test it before it goes into production. And actually, one of the things they found was, this group found, was because they had this in their build, in their continuous build, is that um, they actually had a monitor against the real system that was more effective and more reliable than the production monitoring. And people would start to look at their build monitor, the web page for their build monitor, before they went to look at production. They'd get the phone calls first. Then they could, they could call up the operations people before they knew anything had happened. Nice separation of concerns, so you can, it gives you more control over what you do. So, let me go back to logs. This is a real word. Anyway. So here's some standard loggy, loggy sort of code. Very common things, um, and a nightmare to test. So, why is that a debug and that's an info, that's an error? Don't know, not clear you notice you get inconsistent formats. You get the URL at the end here and in the middle at that point. Again, very unpleasant for scraping. Nobody's thinking about who's going to use this. Um, this one. This says, I really don't know what to do with this exception, so I'm going to log it as an error and rethrow it. What happens at the next level up? They log it as an error and rethrow it and the next level, and the next level. We don't even know if this is an error. If we're not catching it ourselves, we don't, we, can't, we don't know that it's an error because it might be perfectly acceptable. But we told the world it's an error, so you live with that. Um, and if you think about the production side of things, um, all of this is, is a complete nightmare. And we've worked, on, you know, we've worked on systems where the logging was so big. Well, then, you know, one system where the logging was so big that by the time bug reports made it 12 days later through to the development team, the logs had been rolled off. So there would be no loss of information if they just stopped turned the logging off. <coughs> and there's a chap called Martin Thompson who does a lot of work on high-performance Java. And regularly he, go he goes to systems and he finds that the, an awful lot of the performance costs of the system are in logging because they haven't been thinking about it. So, again... Instead of doing this, why don't we actually say what we meant rather than what we were thinking, you know, whatever happened to fall into our hands at the time and perhaps say something like this. Let's describe the events that came, come through and report them to whoever's interested but in, in the domain terms. 
and uh, we'll let somebody else take care of what that means. And what that might mean, in this particular case, is the system happened to be sitting on a message bus, a reliable message bus, already. So why don't we use that instead? This becomes possible if we're no longer talking about implementation, we're talking about what we want to happen. Once you do that, you drop structured messages on the bus and the people can listen to what they're interested in. And some of that might be production logging, or production monitoring, rather. Some of them might be logging, but that's a choice, not an implementation. And if you're really clever, you might do some self-healing or something. Look, look, catch problems before they, uh, before they actually happen. So this is something that we, you put in to make the thing easier to test, because testing logs are deeply unpleasant. And it turns out to have this nice property that, that um, it opens up new possibilities. And once you've got that in place, well, here's a nice example. So you've got this thing where you send a request, and it does some business, and at the end, it's all finished. How do you know when it's finished? Well, you can get the system to tell you. You can get it to broadcast a finished event. <coughs> and that makes the test nice and clean. You, you know, very simple. There's, you don't have to do with a lot of weights and things, or a lot of probing, because the, the <coughs> bus will do the work for you. That has a nice feature in production, which is I need to bring the system down cleanly. I turn off the tap on the requests, so I stop any new requests coming in. When I get all the finished events, I know that the system is clean. I can just shut it down. So another thing we see sometimes is um, systems that have timed events, like end of day processing or there's a timeout, you know, if something hasn't happened in a particular time. And again, that's very, very difficult to work with if you try to write tests against it. So here's a common sort of thing. Um, we feed in some requests via the GUI. Um, inside is a scheduler that fires off events subject to some kind of configuration. And then other things. This is actually um, for doing big calculations. So it farms out, the, farms out a bunch of requests to the compute engine and then comes back later on. How do we Firstly, how do we test the actual scheduler when our only access is in through this large lump of system? And secondly, if we're testing the system, how do we do that with when the scheduler is buried inside and we can't control it. And I've worked on systems where what they do is they bring it down, they fiddle with the config configuration, they bring it up again, and, you know, very slow and brittle. So why don't we pull out the scheduler to make it easier to work with? And again, we can do something very simple. So the system makes requests to the scheduler, wake me up at a particular time, and the scheduler, scheduler calls back um, at the relevant time. So now we have something isolated, we can actually exercise that properly. Um, we can actually do proper, proper system tests on that. <coughs> Plus, we now, we've broken this, this dependency, and now our tests go like this. And we've isolated, we've chopped off all the unpleasantness that will make the system hard to work with. And we have a, um, these fake simplicators, which is the the uh, external uh, system, which we, we can implement in the test and, and feed canned, re canned responses in. And we have a fake scheduler, so we can step time through the system and actually control what happens. And one way to look at that is, if this is our full, sort of full-on end-to-end test, where it's completely black box, and you do need some of these, but not all testing has to be, not all system testing has to be like this. We can also do a lot more testing like this, where we come in at the ports level. And that shows us that the, we've got the fundamental, um, you know, we've got the fundamental behavior that we require, uh, but without the overhead of the, uh, of the full uh, system test. We still need some of these, but not, not all of them. So, it's hard to write a failing test. That's a clue. Maybe it's, it's trying to tell you something about the system. 
And one of the things we're trying to get to is a system we can actually observe and monitor. And we also learned that the 70s was a complete fashion disaster. But anyway, um, what we think the sort of things we want to do are to understand its current state and detect and diagnose errors and clean up. So again, what, what we found is that the sort of things that we need to do to be able to test are uh, the sort of things we need to support. When you're, trying to when you're trying to test a system and you can't get the information you need out of it, that's a clue that, that there's something that you need to see in the system that you don't have control of. So if we use unit tests to help keep a system easy to modify, to help us with the design at the, at the, at the code, we use system tests to help keep a system easy to support. That's it. Any, uh, oh, 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> it's very warm in here. Any, any, any thoughts? Any questions? And we're all just desperate to get out of the room. Little beer, yes. I don't know if there's any beer at lunch. Okay. All right. Well, I'm around at least for today. There's a. I've got a. For those of you who are practicing coders, there's, I have a workshop this afternoon. If you're interested. What do you mean introduction to it? Oh, the workshop. Yeah. Okay. Briefly, it's it's called test driven development as you me as if you meant it, um, which was designed by a colleague of mine called Keith Braithwaite. And the idea is that. Let's see what happens if we actually believe what we say and we completely, completely push test-driven development as far as we can go. And um, certainly what we found is it's very, it's very surprising and it's much harder than you think. Um, and it, it, tells you, it tells you things about the process of test-driven development that you might not have thought of. That's the claim. You just need a laptop, uh, whatever language you've got, and some kind of test framework. That's all. Okay? Good. Well, thank you very much.